You're watching the sermon of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's sermon is preached by Matt Beckish, elder at Reformed Baptist Church of Scranton. I want to preach from this text and, and bring forth the wonderful truth of this subject for two reasons. First, because it's found right here in this text and in many other places throughout the Bible, and therefore it must be taught. But secondly, I want to preach from a passage on this subject this, this day um, because I've heard so many Christians, even in my own experience, uh, deny this wonderful doctrine. They've been taught erroneously that a Christian can never hold any real assurance of his or her salvation, that it's ultimately in the hands of the believer to hold onto their faith or to otherwise lose it and lose their eternal salvation, that apostasy and ultimate ruin are actually possible for the true child of God. That is very saddening, brethren. It's very saddening that believers can be led away from the comforts and the joys that are found in this great doctrine. Uh, to this end, Charles Spurgeon, that, fav that famous Calvinistic Baptist preacher, is recorded to have said this, If I did not believe the doctrine of the final perseverance of the saints, I think I should be of all men the most miserable, because I should lack any ground for comfort. Spurgeon looked at himself and found nothing good in and of himself. He only saw weakness. His hope was in God. It's very saddening as well that God should be robbed of such glory due to his name from the truths found in this doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. It is due to the grace and the faithfulness of God alone that any man will ever be saved. To teach that salvation ultimately depends upon the, the will and the strength of the man is outright theft of the glory that is due to our great God. This type of error should never be, be, brethren, in the church. The church of God is meant to live and to function under the, the strengthening joy that comes from this great doctrine. And the only true and living God is meant to receive all of the glory for it. Now, before we read the word of God, let's pray. Father, as we set our minds on your word today, and, and particularly on such a glorious doctrine which ascribes such honor to you and such rich comfort to your people, we ask, Lord, that you would be most gracious to us. Lord, I ask that you would train up your people and build up your people in their most precious and holy faith, through the preaching of the word. Encourage your people through the unchanging truths found here in your word, Lord, and, and bring glory to your great name in this place today. For it's in Jesus' name and for his great glory that we ask these things. Amen. Look with me now, brethren, at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and beginning in verse 4. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. That may differ slightly from your version. I'm not sure what version you typically read from, but follow along. Um, this is the Apostle Paul speaking from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless. By whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Brethren, we have just read 
a great promise made here in verse 8 of our passage. It's probably one of the grandest promises that has been made in all of the scriptures. And that promise right here in black and white is that you as a true Christian will most certainly be powerfully sustained in your faith right to the end and that you will be found guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will be sustained so as not to fall away and you will most certainly be brought to a state of eternal glory and everlasting fellowship with Jesus Christ. In other words, no matter what this world throws at you, no matter how weak that you may think that you are, you, if you are a true believer, will endure by the power of our faithful God so that you can never ultimately fall away and lose your salvation. Verse 8 says that the Lord Jesus will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to break down this statement today. So let me first talk to you about the context in which it is given. And I want to do this in order to dispel any wrong ideas that one might have over such an extravagant promise as this one. I fear that there are many struggling Christians out there, many who, well, excuse me, I forgot to turn this on. I apologize. I fear that there are many struggling Christians out there, many who hear a promise like this, and yet they think that it could not possibly be for them. They know that they have believed upon Jesus Christ, and they agree that God has made this promise and that he will most certainly keep it. But they fear that it's somehow not for them. A promise like that they believe must be only for those super saints who, who never seem to struggle, who always seem to have it together. But it could never possibly be for me who struggles so fiercely under temptation, who fails so often, who finds himself repenting so often from sin. Well, let me try to dispel that false fear by pointing out the obvious. And that is that Paul is making this most extravagant of promises directly to the members of the local church in the city of Corinth. If you let your eyes wander up just a few verses, you can read who Paul is addressing these words to. In verse 2, we read Paul's words, to the church of God that is in Corinth. This most extravagant promise has been made to those who are a part of the Corinthian church. And it's for them that Paul gives thanks to God in verse 4. And it's they, Paul says in verse 7, who are awaiting the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's those very same members of the local church in Corinth that Paul says that the Lord God Almighty and his son Jesus Christ will sustain to the end, guiltless, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not making that promise to an elite few in Corinth, to some super saints. No, he is making it to the entire church of God that is in Corinth. Now, I'm making this obvious point for one reason, and that reason is that this most grand of promises is not being made to some flawless super Christians, but it's been given to the members of a very immature church that is struggling mightily under various sins. As you read through this entire epistle, you will see that the Corinthian church was a church suffering from many gross disorders. A few verses down the page, right here in chapter 1, we read how they were struggling under the sin of pride, allowing for great divisions and factions within their body. They had succumbed to worldly wisdom rather than the wisdom of God. And so they were failing to enjoy the, the precious fellowship in which they were meant to live. In chapter 6, we read how they were struggling with the sins of greed and unforgiveness as they were found suing one another, their fellow brethren in the church. 
In chapter 6, we read, too, of how they were struggling under the temptations of sexual immorality. And in chapter 11, we read even of their impiety and their drunkenness at the Lord's table. This was a church that was struggling. These were believers that were struggling. And yet, amazingly, as you can read in these wonderful opening verses of 1 Corinthians, Paul rejoices over these very same struggling believers and does not hesitate to hold out this most grand of promises, even to them, of their ultimate perseverance. Why? How could Paul be so confident in the ultimate end of these struggling Christians? It's because Paul thoroughly understood the grace of God. Listen to what he writes in Titus chapter 3. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Paul understood that the ultimate promise of salvation was not based upon the merit of the believer or the strength of the believer or the will of the believer, but on the mercy of God alone. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Brethren, take a hold of this verse. Though you may struggle and struggle mightily, though you may personally fail and fail often, If you have truly called upon the name of Christ by faith, then this most glorious promise is surely yours as well. You too, just like these struggling Corinthians, will be sustained to the end and found guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I say that because Paul holds out this promise to the Corinthians together with all those in every place, verse 2 says, who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This promise is made to all true Christians. Now, let me just pause for a moment. I need to ask you at this time, have you truly done this? Have you truly called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because this promise is only for those who have. I'm not talking about some empty profession of faith here. I'm talking about someone who has come to Christ. As I'm not talking about someone who's come to Christ for an insurance policy to stay out of hell and yet still loves to wallow in the hog pen of sin. The question is, have you been brought to the place where you have seen your need for Jesus Christ? Have you been brought to the place where you've seen and confessed your sinfulness and your own wretchedness before this most holy Jesus Christ? Have you personally submitted yourself to his absolute lordship over your life? Have you recognized him alone to be the Christ, the only Savior sent by God who can set you free from the guilt and the power of your sin? And have you seen his mercy? And have you called out personally to him, empty-handed like a beggar, seeking for forgiveness and for eternal life? And do you now, though you fail so often, do you now long for holiness and righteousness and fellowship with Jesus Christ? If so, This promise is for you. This promise of ultimate perseverance, of being upheld by God right to the very end, is for every true believer. It is for all of those in every place who have truly called upon the name of Christ Jesus. Now let's turn back to our text and look very closely again at this most wonderful promise. What has God promised to do for his people here? In verse 8, we read that God will sustain you. But what does that word really mean? Well, according to the English dictionary, the 
word sustain means to strengthen and support, to hold up, to cause, to stand fast, to uphold. That's God's promise to his people. He, by his great power, promises to uphold us and to cause us to stand fast. God, who has begun this good work of salvation in us and carried it on thus far, has promised that he will not leave it unfinished. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 puts it this way. It says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. When Paul says, I am sure of this, he is not putting his trust in the faithfulness of the believer, but in the faithfulness of God to complete this work of salvation in each and every one of his people. This is the idea of this word sustain. It is that the Lord, by his great faithfulness and strength, will never allow his people to be moved. He will uphold every one of his people to the very end. And that's a good thing, brethren, because the dangers of the world and the flesh and the devil are truly appalling. How many souls have there been who have fallen to the lies of our great enemy, Satan. Think of all the false religions out there. How many people have fallen to the lies and traps of false teachers, liars like their father, the devil, who entrap men in ignorance and lies? There are approximately 1.8 billion people entrapped in Islam. There are another 1.2 billion people sold under Hinduism. Another half a billion are perishing apart from the only Savior, Jesus Christ, under Buddhism. Not to mention the over 500 million atheists out there. Never underestimate the effect of Satan's lies on humanity. How many have fallen to the lies of Satan? And then there's the dangers of the deceitful lures of the world. How many people have been tempted away into eternal destruction by the lusts of this world. Countless men and women have distracted themselves to their graves by the lures of this vanity fair, fame, career, wealth, never even considering the weighty matters that could have led to eternal life. And then there's the flesh. Consider your own flesh that wages war against the spirit, even now, trying constantly to drag you back down into the deadly corruptions of sin. What a fearful thing it is. All you have to do is walk with the Lord, and you will soon see that your greatest enemy is the one in the mirror. Considering these great dangers, brethren, and the vast numbers of humanity that have fallen all around us, there can be no other conclusion but that that one can be kept alive by nothing less than the divine power and faithfulness of God. Praise God that he upholds a people for his own possession, for without his power, who could stand? I'm reminded here of Psalm 91 and verses 7 through 10, in which the Lord promises to his elect, a thousand may fall at your right side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near to you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. But you have made, you who have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. Brethren, this is the great promise of God, that he will uphold us and keep us from ultimately falling away. It is God who will sustain you through all troubles right to the end. Did you know that the salvation that you possess is not dependent upon your own will or your own strength, but upon the strength and the sustaining power of God himself? The Bible teaches this very clearly. I want you to see the means. God is a God of means. And I want you to see the means through which he will uphold and and sustain each of you. First, you will be ultimately saved 
because God the Father chose you. And he set his unchanging love upon you, not because you chose him. Secondly, you will be saved because of the work of Christ, not because of your own work. And third, you will be saved because of the renewing and sustaining power of the Holy Spirit and not because of your own power. When God says that he will sustain you, know that you will be upheld by his infallible, this infallible and Trinitarian work of God. As we consider just how God will sustain you, let me start first with God the Father's sovereign choice to set his love upon you. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That was you, brethren. When God looked forward from eternity past, down through the corridors of time, when he looked upon you, he did not see someone deserving mercy. He didn't see someone who would choose him and faithfully cling to him. He saw a dead sinner, someone who was by nature a son of disobedience, someone who by nature loved his sin, someone who was by nature a child of wrath. That's what this passage says, that we all were just like the rest of mankind. But God, this passage says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Then just a couple verses down we read, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. But in this passage shows you the undeserved mercy and grace that God the Father has had upon you. You have been delivered from sin and from wrath, and you have been granted eternal happiness by the free and undeserved love and favor of God alone. God the Father chose to have mercy upon you, though you were dead in your sins. This salvation was a free gift to you. You were completely undeserving. He didn't choose you because of something good that he saw in you. No, this passage says that he chose you simply according to his own great love that he set upon you. In Romans chapter 9, we read, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion, so that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. You have no reason to boast, brethren, nor any reason to fear because your salvation was a gift, freely given by your heavenly Father, and it securely rests upon the unchangeableness of his love that he has chosen to set upon you. Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 5 through 6 says, He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. You will ultimately be saved because God the Father, according to his, his own kind and sovereign will and pleasure, chose you and lavished his unchanging love upon you, and he now promises to uphold you. It was not for the sake of anything foreseen in you, but according to his sovereign will and purpose. Brethren, God gives no reason to us for 
why he gives such mercy to some and, and not to others, but only that it's according to his own good pleasure to make some the monuments of mercy and grace, while others are passed by and given what they justly deserve. He claims full and absolute prerogative to do so without any excuse or apology. Based on this, please know that whatever good comes to you from God, it's not to be ascribed in any way to your own merit, but to the unchanging love and mercy of God alone. And brethren, this means that he will never abandon you. This is an unchanging love, welling up from the immutable character of God. Isaiah 54 and verse 10 says, For the mountains may depart, and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. See the character of your God. For then sooner shall the everlasting mountains and the perpetual hills be removed and God's covenant love for his people be broken. Your friends will fail you. You will fail yourself. You probably have failed yourself already today. But God's great kindness and love towards you will never depart you as a child of God. He will love you to the very end. His love is immovable because it is built not on your faithfulness or your merit, but upon his own mercy, which is from everlasting to everlasting. Consider, brethren, the goodness of God the Father, that he should determine to save any sinners from that great heap of fallen, rebellious humanity. Poor sinners should take great comfort from such unbreakable goodness and mercy shown to us. And, and we should just throw ourselves down and, and just give at our Heavenly Father's feet and just offer up great praise and thanksgiving, for you will be upheld by the unchangeable electing love of the Father. Now, secondly, brethren, you will be upheld to the end, not by your own faithfulness, but by the faithful intercession of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ's intercession that sustains you as a believer, even now. Romans chapter 5 and verse 10 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Brethren, it is beyond dispute that no sinner could ever be saved apart from Christ's death on the cross. We have been justified by Christ's shed blood, reconciled to God by Christ's death. Sin is pardoned, the sinner accepted as righteous, the enmity between holy God and sinful man slain by Jesus' death. But even more, this text says, we are saved by his life. Now, the phrase his life is not to be understood as Jesus' righteous life while here in the flesh, but his life now in heaven. It is the living Christ, whoever lives to make intercession for us. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Our high priest, Jesus Christ, continues on forever and ever, and his priesthood and his mediation are forever. There is no hour or minute or second in which the people of God are without an advocate, in which they are without the intercession of Jesus Christ on their behalf. Consider that. This is your safety. In your happiness, brethren, that because Christ always lives, he is able to uphold you and to save you to the uttermost in all times, at every juncture. All who come to God through Christ are being upheld and preserved by his 
intercession. Now, I want you to see the effectiveness of this intercession. Listen to Christ's high priestly prayer as found in John chapter 17. In verses 10 through 12, we read Jesus' prayer to the Father on our behalf. All, he says this, All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And then Jesus prays just a couple verses down in verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Brethren, hear Christ's powerful intercession on your behalf. He doesn't pray for your riches or for your health, but that each and every one of you be kept and upheld. He prays fervently that you be kept from falling to the destructive influences of sin. He prays effectively that you would be strengthened and furnished for your duty. And later, he prays that you would ultimately be brought to glory to be with him and to see his glory. Our advocate with the Father, our mediator, Christ Jesus, our great high priest, is fully acquainted with all of the dangers and the difficulties that assail you. And he knows how to intercede for each of you. He pleads for your preservation. Keep them from the evil one. He doesn't pray for your removal from the world because he has work for you to do. He would have you to be salt and light that many would believe through your witness. He doesn't pray that, that no trial or tribulation come upon you, but he prays that you would be kept and preserved through all the troubles that will assail you. He commits you to the protection of his Father, Almighty God himself. One of the very best illustrations of the effectiveness of Christ's intercession can be found in Luke's Gospel. And that's the account of Peter and his denial of Christ. This man, Peter, who had, who had followed Christ faithfully in the midst of all manner of danger, denied him when he made that final journey to the cross. Peter publicly and boldly denied that he had ever even known Jesus. He did so with a solemn oath. Could such a man who had turned his back on his Savior, his Lord, his friend, ever again be confident that he would one day enter into that promise of eternal glory? Well, the answer to that question is yes. In Luke 22 and verses 31 through 34, we have the record of Jesus' prediction of Peter's denial. There we read Jesus' words, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Brethren, Satan desired to accuse Peter. He desired to have his way with Peter, to prove him to be only one who sought after fame and power and his own glory. He wanted to sift Peter like wheat, to prove him to be not wheat but chaff. And that time would soon come when Satan would sift Peter and Peter would fall mightily under the weight of temptation and deny his Lord. But what did Jesus say about this time? He comforted Peter by assuring him that he would not ultimately lose his faith. And the reason Jesus gives that his faith wouldn't fail was not Peter's strength, or Peter's strength of will, or Peter's faithfulness, but that Jesus had prayed for him, that he had interceded for him. Peter would not fall away from the faith 
because Jesus had interceded for him and kept him from falling to the very designs of Satan. What an amazing thing. But it's even more amazing, brethren, to consider that Jesus Christ prays in the very same way for each and every Christian alive today. He prays for you as a true believer today in this way. He prays to keep you from falling to the design of Satan's, to his lies, to his temptations. He ever lives to intercede for you, brethren. If you are a Christian, Jesus Christ is praying for you. He is praying that your faith will not fail, no matter how far you fall. Though your faith may be buffeted and tried and shaken, it will not ultimately fail. There will never be a total and final failure of the faith of the true believer because of Jesus Christ's intercession. We can be confident, brethren, of our salvation because we have a living hope. We have a living Savior, one who is praying every day at the throne of God that your faith will not fail. You are being upheld by the Father. You are being upheld by the Son. And finally, you are being upheld by the abiding power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit abides in you, you can never ultimately fall. First John chapter 3 and verse 9 says, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Brethren, to be born of God is to be inwardly renewed and transformed by the power of the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit abides in you, you can no longer continue on the course of practicing sin. You will surely commit sin, but sin can no longer dominate you. By the Spirit of God, There is now new light in your mind that shows you the evil of sin. You never saw it before, but you can see it now. You know what it's like when you talk to an unbeliever, you try to witness to them. They can't see, let alone hate their sin. But as one who has been born of God, you do. Your heart has been renewed so that you now loathe the idea of the filth of sin. There is a new principle within you of hatred of your sin and a spirit of repentance for sin when you commit it. You are now a new creature because you have been born of God by the Spirit of God. Your soul is now and forever spiritually alive to such a degree that the Bible can definitively say to you that no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. In fact, the empowering help of the Spirit is so effective that the Bible is able to say that because the Spirit dwells in you, he has sealed you, he has separated you out and set you apart for God. You have been marked as belonging to God. Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 13 through 14 say, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel, of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Brethren, when this verse says that the Spirit is the guarantee of your inheritance, it is saying that the abiding of the Holy Spirit within you is the down payment made by God himself that unchangeably secures the full sum of your promised inheritance. If the Spirit dwells in you, which he does within all Christians, then your eternal redemption is as sure as already being possessed. That's the absolute guarantee, the formal promise and assurance of God to you as his child. It is so sure a thing that Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 can say, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead 
will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. There is no maybe here. There is no if only you cling here, but an absolute will. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. If you are born again, you have been quickened. You are being upheld by the empowering of the Spirit, and you have been sealed by the Spirit and guaranteed the promise of eternal life. Brethren, through these infallible means, you will be sustained to the end. That's the promise of God. Be encouraged one last time by the sureness of this promise. Romans chapter 8 and verse 30 says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Did you get that? There is not one person lost in this golden chain. Every single soul that God the Father has graciously and mercilessly, mercifully chosen to set his love upon will be called. And every single one who has been called will be justified by the work of Christ, by Christ's shed blood. And every single man, woman, or child who has been justified will be glorified. There are no exceptions. They will be sustained. None will fall away. Satan will not have victory over a single one. Not a one will be lost. You have been chosen by God the Father and upheld by his immutable love for your soul. You have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ and are now being upheld by his most powerful intercession. And you have been renewed and you are being empowered by the Spirit of God, the very Spirit of the living God, whose indwelling is the absolute down payment and guarantee of your eternal salvation. Men leave work unfinished. If it were up to you, you would most surely fall short. But God will do it. God will finish what he has started in you. You may fall in this life, into even some grievous sin. You may, for a time, neglect the means of grace and cause yourself to stumble severely. You may grieve the Holy Spirit, leaving your assurance greatly shaken. You may even come under God's chastening discipline. Nevertheless, you will never fall away. God will use these means, and you will repent and you will be preserved by faith right to the end. And what will be that end? You will be found guiltless. You will be accepted in Christ Jesus. You will be washed clean by his shed blood. You will be clothed in his pristine righteousness as you stand before God, and you will be vindicated, and you will enter into eternal and blessed fellowship with Jesus Christ. That is the promise given here to us in 1 Corinthians, and all of it will be because of the faithfulness of God. He will uphold you to the end, guiltless. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, let me end with just a, a couple brief applications. First, to the unbeliever. None of the promises that have just been spoken here are yours apart from Jesus Christ. You need Christ. Because apart from Christ, it is utterly impossible to persevere to the end. Psalm 1 says this of you, The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked 
will perish. Friend, apart from Christ, you will perish. Don't leave here today apart from the only Savior of sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ. Bow your proud heart down to Christ. Submit to his lordship. Repent of your sin and of your sinfulness. Believe me, you are a sinner. There is none that is righteous, not one. Repent of your sin and of your sinfulness and flee to the only one who can provide forgiveness for your sins. He, Jesus Christ, lived a perfectly righteous and sinless life in this world. That's why he came into the world. He upheld the law. He fulfilled the law as a substitute for his people. And he is willing to clothe all that come to him by faith alone in that pristine righteousness. It's the very righteousness that you need to stand before God as guiltless. You need Christ. He is willing to wash you clean of all of your sin and your unrighteousness by the shed blood of Calvary. All you need do is come. He is merciful, most merciful, and will not turn you away. Listen to Jesus Christ's invitation from John chapter 6. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Friend, come to Jesus Christ. And to the Christian, what should you do with the things heard today? Well, someone might be tempted to think, well, if God is doing all the work here, I guess I'll just let go and let God. Well, brethren, that is the opposite of what the Bible calls you to do with the grace of God that has been granted to you. No, in light of all of these precious promises, the Bible urges you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which you have been called. Knowing then that, that you have been chosen by God, God the Father, and that he will strengthen you, you are exhorted to run hard to the finish. Knowing that Christ intercedes on your behalf, put to death the sin that remains. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self. Be holy. And when you fall, knowing that you are being strengthened and empowered by the Spirit, seek diligently from him who strengthens you to get back up in repentance and in new obedience knowing that God will surely uphold you. Seek the strength needed from him. Ask for it, knowing that it is his will to give you all that you need to run your race right to the finish. And finally, may I exhort you, do not rob God. Be sure to give all glory and praise and honor to him for this great salvation, for the work of salvation belongs to the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon from North Valley Baptist Church. For the sermon archives and for more information about the church, please visit www.northvalleybaptistpa.org.